Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Hope to have a good conversation here about the impact that COVID has had on businesses, both traditional and e-commerce. Uh, we're hoping to share some insights, have a casual conversation that helps us guide our customers and our, our, our partners along this journey of how do they react to COVID, especially as it relates to e-commerce. So the first question we have is what impact is coronavirus having on e-commerce? So far, it's having a, a positive impact on e-commerce. Um, you know, people are turning to digital ways of acquiring the things they need to do to get through their daily lives. But we're also seeing some that are in the more discretionary space. Those that sell toys and games are also doing well. My thoughts are, I think it's short term, definitely going to be a, a gain for e-commerce businesses. Then we have to look at the downside on, is that cannibalizing their traditional business? Well, I think it's also impossible to talk about the impacts of coronavirus on e-commerce without talking about some of those challenges that have arisen as well. Certainly the volume is there, um, but with those increases in orders come challenges and stresses on your fulfillment, um, return costs, uh, shipping, restocking. And I think we've all seen the increase in um, fulfillment times or shipping times. So as companies are seeing all these influxes of orders, they're also like, oh my gosh, how do I keep up with this and maintain um, customer relationships, customer service teams are really strapped. Um, so I think it's kind of that broader look at how do we streamline things, automate things to make marketing um, a little bit easier. That way we can create a really good uh, customer service experience as well. Yeah, I think another issue that all businesses are facing, whether they're being disrupted because of COVID or they're looking at growth in the e-commerce section, uh, because of it is, do I take on more overhead? Do I hire for this? Is this a temporary spike? Should I have more people under my employ? And what happens when there's a regression to the mean? How fast will retail see a resurgence and e-commerce kind of level off a bit? And how much of that are e-commerce businesses going to capture and retain? How's the messaging on that front? So there's a lot of questions, I think, that are being stirred up by this business disruption. Absolutely. I think, Molly, you're onto some good stuff that we need to be helping them with. And to solve both of those is automation and doing what we can to smooth those processes out uh, using the tools that, that the Internet has given us. Right. But certainly the lag times, I think, Dirk, you might be right that those lag times are going to cause us that, boy, if we could just run to the store and get it, we might. Right. Whereas, two, you know, six months ago, we would have just ordered it on Amazon now. Uh, there's that reality that sometimes I just ordered something apart for one of my kids' dirt bikes is going to take me until the end of July to get it. Boy, if there was somewhere local I could run and get it, I would. I think too, Molly, you might be able to speak to this a little bit more too, but I think it's going to become um, even more increasingly important for uh, stores to tell their story. I think we're going to see uh, added noise in the the market and in um, e-commerce because there's so many more people in the game now. Um, and so it's going to dilute um, the market, so to speak. And I think telling um, your unique story and how you're, um, you're better than your competition is going to become even more important than it was before. Absolutely. Those first time purchases are a lot more difficult to capture in this very noisy e-commerce environment, especially when you have the convenience of Amazon where you can just, go find whatever you're looking for, grab up things across all different verticals that will ship to you within two days. Um, customers are not necessarily as likely to do that search and actually go to your business's website and make a purchase that way. So you need to really be proactive about getting a compelling message out there in front of your audience where they're spending time. That's where social media comes in and email marketing comes in, and PPC, uh, Google shopping ads, kind of considering all of those things that maybe you've thought about, but weren't ready to pull the trigger on, now really is the time um, to work those into your strategy. Well, that's a fascinating subject, Molly, because, you know, Amazon does account for roughly 35 to 40% of the entire e-commerce market. So if you're an e-commerce retailer, you, you need to be on that platform to some degree, or at least you should strongly consider it as an addendum to your primary service line. But things like uh, shipping times being delayed because it's not being an essential product versus essential product. Really what I've seen happen is that uh, we're talking about digital shelf space. You know, if you think about going into a traditional store and you look at the shelf, you see all the products. Well, not all those products are getting represented now because of this disruption. 
So people are looking to other places. They're, they're finding possibly your business on e-commerce for the first time. And they, they may not come back after this once their normal channel is open back up. So you have this opportunity to make an impression and build a relationship with a customer to not only solve their need now, but also build messaging that retains them for the future and keeps them coming back. So if that hasn't been on the forefront of your thinking as an e-commerce uh, operation, it should be there now. It, continuing that customer relationship is going to be big because you don't want to lose this opportunity. Absolutely. That, that's a great segue into the next question, Dirk, because uh, it, it relates to those businesses that have been on the fence about whether or not they should do e-commerce, right? We serve a lot of manufacturers being in Ohio. We've had that debate with many because they don't want to upset their distribution network at the same time they consider e-commerce. You know, most of them are ending up there over the years. We're watching that happen. <clears throat> and there are a few that I've talked to of late that have, have dipped their toe into e-commerce and now they're going, oh my gosh, my e-commerce is up 200% or 300%. And, and that's because they can't get their products through the normal channels, whether that be a, a, a retail establishment or maybe some of the other online channels that they would use. And I see that as it's a challenge for sure. It is also an opportunity to start building that relationship with that customer base. And instead of having some other outlet own your relationship with your customer, start owning it yourself because those, those increases aren't gonna maintain when those other channels open back up. So I think you, you touched on dipping your toe in and I think that's the biggest thing that um, customers that haven't done e-commerce yet, they just need to dip their toe in. You know, oftentimes even in web design, everything, you have this perfect image in mind and what you don't realize is you have to get started and starting by dipping your toe in um, is the best way to do it. And rather than wait till something's perfect, you're gonna miss out on so many sales and so many opportunities to build your brand. And I think e-commerce can be a little bit of a scary and intimidating word for customers that haven't done traditional e-commerce in the past. And there are ways to replicate that e-commerce experience without necessarily doing the full online checkout experience and transactional emails and all the things we think about with e-commerce. Just getting a live chat feature onto your site for those immediate customer interactions, getting product detail pages that really showcase your products, what they are, photos that show multiple angles, maybe a product overview video, and customer testimonials that give social proof that say, I've purchased through this company before, they offer incredible customer service, you should really look into this. Those are all e-commerce elements that help to guide the buyer journey without necessarily some of those um, scarier things about e-commerce that might um, put a customer off. Yeah. There are other factors to that as well that, you know, we hear from our business to business clients that certainly have a product line that would be good for the e-commerce platform, but they're worried about switching over to that because they don't want to damage current relationships with other distributors by undercutting them with a direct to manufacturer option. Now, there are ways around that. It isn't, it isn't always the easiest process, but what happens when you have a major disruption like this and your logistics falls, your, distri uh, your, distributor, uh, your distributors pardon me, um, are having issues fulfilling their orders. Uh, when you know that you have the stuff in a warehouse that you can send directly to customer now, when you have other channels open to deliver that product, but you are essentially uh, facing a bottleneck because you're relying on a traditional distribution method. So I think that there's a chance, even in those scenarios, that an e-commerce option can open up possibilities to um, supplement your business and even grow market share by providing that if not for all of your products, then at least for some of them that fit that mold. So I think there is an e-commerce solution for more traditional focused businesses and much more modern digital based headless uh, organizations that are relying on order fulfillment uh, in, in like a, a cloud environment. So I think that's important to consider as you explore that space. There are solutions even for traditional models. I agree. I think also part of that conversation needs to be there are ways to do those things and fulfill those orders and fulfill the customer demand directly while still protecting your distribution network. Right. right? A, you don't have to undercut them on price more often than not. Um, but that is a giant fear. We hear that all the time. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if your if your distribution network is helping you build this e-commerce presence, they can certainly participate 
in the revenue uh, so that they are protected. So there are ways and, and conversations that need to be had that could protect that distribution network while also allowing, keeping the customer in the market happy and fulfilling the need from an e-commerce standpoint.